Okay, thank you very much again. Um, I think you'll probably be fed up hearing from me after all of this. Um, <clears throat> so thank you again for inviting me. I apologize for the second time for not submitting something in advance, but as I said, I've just been very busy times. So um, I'm going to be saying, looking at judicial independence, the rule of law and sovereignty conflicts. And I'm hoping I'll get all this done within the time frame. I'm, I would definitely do that. So let me just start off by saying there is a very rich existing literature that charts in detail the principal nature of the rule of law problem in the EU, in particular rule of law backsliding, which has been undertaken in particular by Poland and Hungary. And that literature also addresses the ways that it has been, that the rule of law has been or might be addressed. And they include a list of different uh, actions taken at EU level, <coughs> which will be familiar, I think, to everyone around this room, but just to mention them here. And for the people who are listening in, there's the Commission EU rule of law framework, there's the council's annual rule of law dialogue, there are uses of courts through preliminary rulings and infringement proceedings, there's the rule of law review cycle, and there's monetary incentives for compliance or rule of law uh, compliance conditionality, um, about which I'll say more a little later because it's literally ongoing as we speak today. So just to attest to the fact that this very rich existing literature, this is just a sample of some of the principal writings and contributions in this area. It's got a predominantly legal focus because those are the uh, materials that I've been looking at in particular, but the material here is not just purely legal. You'll note here that there are people in this room, friends and colleagues, Carlos and Dimitri, who have written with great authority and insight on these issues on more than one occasion, and we are indebted to them for their contributions to this debate. Um, so I was thinking then in the light of this, what I was going to say in this panel, and um, it became clear to me, I don't intend to traverse this terrain, this terrain of everything that's gone before, that would in any event be impossible within the time we have available. What I would trying to do then in this contribution is to look at or focus on the rule of law problem and what it has to tell us about the subject matter of the present conference, i.e. sovereignty conflicts at national level and the way in which those play out at EU level. And so that's the focus of what I've got to say here after. Now, let me say at the outset that it is clear that this issue, the rule of law problem, does indeed fit with the thesis articulated in the main paper that we talked about in the previous session, which was prepared by the conference organizers. The rule of law and sovereignty issues at the EU level are the consequence of rule of law and sovereignty divisions within the respective member states. And it's certainly one of the prime, if not the best example of the way in which those sovereignty problems at uh, national level are then manifesting themselves in disputes at the EU level. So the interesting issue then is what, having said that, because that's pretty obvious, is what more we can learn about the nature of such conflicts, sovereignty conflicts within the member states by, and the way in which the EU deals with them by focusing on the rule of law problem. 
So that's, again, what I'm going to try and do and say a few words about. And I look at sovereignty conflicts with starting off with the member state dimension, and then I look at sovereignty conflicts and look at the EU dimension. And I don't think anything I'm about to say is rocket science, but I think it's fairly fundamental and important nonetheless. So not all sovereignty conflicts within member states are created equal. They're not, in other words, all of equal importance, whether judged by temporal or substantive criteria. So if you think of the temporal some, uh, criteria, some sovereignty conflicts within member states may be evanescent, they may be fleeting, they may be related to a single issue that will pass quickly with the affliction of time. Others, however, may be more problematic, they may have no natural endpoint, and they may be systemic. And it seems to me the rule of law problem as it's manifesting itself in Poland and Hungary comes more within the latter category than within the former. Then you've got a substantive dimension. The subject matter affected by the internal sovereignty division may vary considerably. It may, other things being equal, be relatively uh, contained or it may be substantively significant. Rule of law backsliding as it operates and as manifest in Poland and Hungary, which inter alia affects the judiciary, falls within the latter category. And I think that's more particularly so when it's part of a larger scenario involving retention of or arrogation of power by the ruling party in a manner which shades from the democratic quickly into the autocratic or the quasi-autocratic. So if we move and then look at sovereignty conflicts from the EU dimension, not all sovereignty conflicts that emanate in member states are of equal importance or difficulty from the EU when they play out at EU level. But it does seem to me that the rule of law problem poses particular difficulties in this regard for a range of reasons. First and most fundamentally and most obviously, um, but I think it really is absolutely fundamental, it calls into question the EU's commitment to the values in Article 2 of the TEU about democracy and the rule of law and the other values mentioned therein, and it calls into question the EU's status as a union of democratic states. That may be straightforward and obvious, but it it's absolutely fundamental and important nonetheless. Secondly, the, the issue, the rule of law problem resulting from the sovereignty division within the member state, the way that manifests itself at the EU level, it's deeply problematic insofar as rule of law backsliding affects the independence of the judiciary and that's a deeply problematic issue for the following four reasons which are related but distinct. So very quickly it's central to any conception of the rule of law that the government should have a legal, should only act on a basis that's deemed valid by that legal system. If the courts lack independence there's a real danger that legal limits on the scope of political power will be ignored or stretched beyond their natural point. Secondly, the uh, judiciary must be independent in order to give legal effect to other precepts which are included in the rule of law. Courts that are not independent may not, for example, protect fundamental rights against executive interference. Thirdly, uh, uh, national courts are central to the preliminary ruling system that is the core of the EU legal order within article as manifest in article 267. Three minutes. If, 
If national courts lack independence, then they may not apply those precepts correctly, may not apply EU law correctly, and they may restrict the flow of preliminary references where there are uh, challenges to national legislative or executive action that's contrary to EU law. And then finally, national courts must be independent for the regime of mutual trust that underpins the European arrest warrant system to work. Um, sorry. Sorry, just one second. Yep, I apologize. Sorry. Um, okay, so the steps taken by the EU to address the problem were set out in an earlier slide, but it's instructive, I think, to step back from those more particular initiatives and to consider the issue from a more structural perspective. And very briefly in the time I have available, I think the following conditions are apposite in this respect and do impact on the more general issues which your study is concerned with. So first there's this disjunction between power and responsibility. The EU is not a state and does not have the plenary powers that attach there too. It, um, it is nonetheless expected to cure or significantly alleviate the malaise that lies at the heart of the rule of, pro, rule, rule of law problem within member states, even though that problem has roots over and beyond anything concerned with the EU. Secondly, I think it's important to understand that member states set the rules of the game that pertain to this issue, the rule of law issue insofar as that relates to treaty articles and the Article 7 procedure. Thirdly, and I think it's important, within those treaty rules, each major EU institution has some autonomy in deciding what it can do and what it will do to address the rule of law problem. For example, the court has made good use of treaty foundations such as Article 19 of the TEU and used those foundations creatively in order to ground and develop its jurisprudence concerning the independence of the judiciary. The Commission, for its part, another example, has exercised discretion concerning whether to bring 258 proceedings and whether to initiate Article 7 proceedings. Just make it clear, I'm not claiming that each of these institutions is perfect. I'm merely providing an architectural frame through which to consider these issues. And then finally, um, um, bringing us right up to date, and I said I'd come back to it, and this is my last slide. The prospects of rule of law conditionality and financial payments penalties rather for non-compliance with the rule of law. Uh, this is an issue which has been mooted ever since at least 2017-18 when the commission did uh, wrote a paper on this. It came back to light again in the summer of this year as a result of the financial deal brokered in order to meet the problems concerned with COVID. And up until recently, there was a deal uh, brokered between the Parliament and the Member States whereby the, there would be such conditionality, rule of law conditionality with penalty payments and a draft regulation. As of yesterday and today, Poland and Hungary are trying to bring nuclear powers to scupper that deal. They are attempting to use their veto uh, unanimity is required for the own resources decision which will implement the budget which contains the new rules and they are trying to um, veto that in order to get the rule of law conditionality removed. Very final point is this, unclear politically whether they'll be able to do that um, unclear whether there'll be sufficient arm twisting to stop them doing it. 
interesting legal and political possibility here, um, which was mooted seriously by Guy Verhofstadt from the European Parliament today, um, when, and I actually think, I'd be interested to see what, to hear what Carlos and Dimitri think, but interesting possibility of he, what he said is, okay, if, the, if, if Poland and Hungary don't back down, we're going to do it by, we won't give them any money at all. We'll implement the own resources decision by enhanced cooperation under 326. And then uh, they don't get any money, um, uh, but we can still implement the own resources decision. This was his argument. And that if they want to join up later and comply with rule of law conditionality, then of course they can under the rules of enhanced cooperation. But his view was a very gutsy view, a very strong view, saying we're not going to be held hostage in this respect. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.